Hello. I've lived in Africa all my life. Um, I was born in Tanzania, a tiny town called the Doma. What we call the traffic jam was three cars <laughs> on the road at the same time. And I come from Uganda originally. Uh, my parents come from Uganda. Or should I say I'm, I'm a local in, in, these, <laughs> in these places? So many new things to learn. But um, I work in Kenya now. And uh, the business that I run with my sister is in Uganda, Kenya, and, Tan and uh, Rwanda. So I guess you could say I'm the East African community poster child. <laughs> but I did spend one year outside of Africa when I did my postgraduate here in the UK. And it taught me a lot of things. As aside from school, I realized that people ask me a lot where I'm from. And initially I said Uganda, but then I realized that Sometimes you're met with blank stares and, you know, like, ah. But sometimes you, you just need to explain a little bit. So I started to say I'm from Africa because, I, you know, other people said that. And it sounded really weird to me. Why would I say I'm from Africa? That's like saying I'm from planet Earth. You know, it's, 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 it's so vast. But for the first time, I was actually forced to think of myself as African because the whole time I lived in Uganda and, and Kenya and Tanzania, I maybe thought of myself as East African, but I never actually sat down and said, this is it, I'm African. What does it mean to be African? So it did open the door for me to start thinking about this new facet of my identity that had been introduced to me. And so as I thought about it, I said, okay, well, let's find out what this means. And if I'm African, What does that mean? So I looked around me. I saw all the trappings of it as were, you know, sold to me. Kinky hair, I already had that, so checklist. Um, I didn't really like African jewelry. I'm sorry. What they, you know, I felt like a traitor for it. But, you know, it was all really brightly colored. And I know it's hard to tell right now, but I'm into monochrome. Um, so it's, it, there were some, some bits of it that, and, and when I thought about it, this is called African jewelry, but really it comes from Kenya and Tanzania and perhaps a few other countries. What about North Africa? What about Togo? What about Cameroon? What about South Africa? Is that the same African jewelry, as we call it? I've been to some African fashion shows that really had fashion from three different countries. And it just made me wonder, what is it that binds us together, that creates this sense of identity for us as African? I know what it means to be Ugandan, at least to, to, to some extent. I know what we have a reputation for, what we're known for. We're supposedly a little more gentle and soft-spoken than our Kenyan neighbors, but just not as laid back as our Tanzanian neighbors. Um, we, we have our own language. We have um, Uglish, which is our version of English. You might have heard of it. Check on Wikipedia. It will be the best two minutes of your life. Um, <laughs> We say things like, you know, you've benched that girl for too long. Stop beeping her. You know you're They're like, yeah. Like, <laughs> cowardizing is a word for us. And I know that people think that we like, you know, green, green bananas, matoke, a lot. And I know that we have such a great sense of community that, you know, personal space is a bit of a foreign concept. And I know all these things about us, and I know our culture, our traditions. I learned how to do the Maganda, uh, which is a traditional dance in high school. I have an idea of what this, Af this Ugandan identity means. When it comes to the African identity, I'm not, I'm not so sure. And yet, I supposedly am African. So I asked, let me try to find out what this means. What, what, does, what is everyone saying about this? And one of the things I realized was that from reading books about leaders that I admired, Sankara, Mandela, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, and reading about the history of Africa, or at least what I could find of it, it seemed that everything that united us, not just as Africans, but as black people, was struggle. Whether it was colonialism, slavery, or racism, it seemed that there was always some struggle that led us to come together and say, OK, we're African. This is who we are. Um, Julius Nyerere, former president of Tanzania, I think put it really well. He said, Africans all over the continent 
without a word spoken to, one to either one individual or another, or one country to another, looked at the European, looked at themselves, and knew that in relation to the European, they were one. And maybe that's why the African identity is so hard to establish, because it's always been based not on what we are, but what we aren't. The same for Africa. Uh, this will probably be familiar to most of you. Africa is often defined from the outside. It is necessary when you are trying to define Africa to look at it as a whole, to do it from the outside. You have to step out of it. And so it's possible to say, well, look, this is the hopeless continent at some point, and then change your mind along the way and say, well, actually, hold on, Africa is rising. And then further down, oh, it's a hopeful continent. This whole continent, 54 countries, more than 2,000 ethnic, 2,000 languages, 3,000 ethnic groups, we can actually sum it all up in one magazine cover. And this seems strange to us. And lately, we've, we've heard a lot of people saying, look, Africa is not a country, OK? And we, we need to speak about this more, and we need to get different narratives out. But if we consider where we are in the space of talking about Africa, I ask myself, who was consulted when the Africa Rising narrative came up? I wasn't. Did, did, did you guys get a handout? I don't know. Maybe you did. I could be wrong. And also, what difference did it make? I can tell you, my grandmother did not know that magazines were writing more positively about Africa. All she knew was the price of sugar was going up, you know? But in terms of these narratives that we talk about and want to change, and I think it's fantastic that we're talking about this now and saying, look, we're pointing fingers at, you know, international media that paints us a certain way and say, this is not how we should do it. Africa is not a country. This is how we should do it. But what are we really doing? In the space of a narrative, we are subjects. I think that it's important to think about what we say about ourselves, even more than it's important to think about what, the, what other people are saying about us. What are Africans saying about Africa? When is the last time we declared something about our identity and about our continent and about who we are and where that comes from? So one of the spokespeople at the Economic Commission for Africa, Carlos Lopez, he said, the problem with narratives like this is that we are subjects and not protagonists. And that theory agrees with something that I think. I think what we need is not narratives. What we need is dialogues. And I'll just borrow from literature to explain this a little bit. Because in the basis terms, a narrative is described as a representation of a, an event or events, while a subject is basically described as words spoken out loud by a character. What are the words spoken out loud by us as Africans? What do we say about ourselves? When I was looking around for what, what does it mean when people say I'm African, what did I find? So when there is a running narrative, you're a subject. When there is a dialogue, you're a protagonist. And you have the chance to tell not just the world, but tell each other and inform your own identity. And I think that's something that we need to strive for. So this is how big this continent is. Sometimes I, I think it's, it's hard to grasp. This is why sometimes people in South Africa will say, oh, in Africa, um, you know, or in North Africa. Or we, sometimes it's easy to forget just how massive this continent is. It fits all those other places inside it, China, Eastern Europe, India, it can all fit in Africa. That's how big it is according to cartographers. And yet, we still have this Africa as a country narrative. <laughs> and I think it's a really good example in terms of talking about narratives, because this is the one that has come up a lot. And we've said this is a narrative that needs to end. So let's just talk about the, the way Ebola was covered, because that, that, that had real ramifications. It's estimated that sub-Saharan Africa, not West Africa, where Ebola actually was, but sub-Saharan Africa lost about $500 million in revenue this year. Hotels in Tanzania had 50% less bookings because of Ebola. 
which never actually happened in Tanzania. There was a scare, but the outbreak never actually went that far. So this is how it was reported in international media. As you can see, it's an African Ebola outbreak. Remember, all 54 countries. This one, I, I mean. <laughs> so there is a woman in Africa <laughs> who survived Ebola. She's in Africa, you know? That's, that's, that's all you need to know. And again, Africa's Ebola outbreak has not run its course. So it, it's not hard to see why, if you looked at these headlines, you'd go and cancel your trip to the Serengeti. Because, you know, th this is Africa. There's Ebola. Like, I wouldn't blame you, because it does look like there's Ebola everywhere in Africa. <laughs> and so Maybe this is the picture that we didn't quite paint, is that actually, you know, this entire part of Africa did, did not have Ebola. And you don't need to look at me suspiciously when you sit next to me on the plane, when I cough and sneeze just because I come from Africa. But we've said a lot about the narratives and, and how Western narratives are, are portrayed, but how about us? What do we say about ourselves? How are we reporting this? Because I think that's more important. You know, you can rise above what other people say about you and think about you. You can never rise above what you say and think about yourself. So clearly, there's a problem. Did we do any better? Here's another headline. So somewhere in Africa, or Africa in general, is receiving drugs. <laughs> so this story, Africa Calls for Ebola Recovery Marshall Plan, was actually, if you read the second and third sentences, about three countries calling for a recovery plan. And this next one, that's, that's heartbreaking, isn't it? But guess what? All three of these came from local African media houses. And I find that tragic. Because the truth is, so many of us local media houses do not have the time, energy, or resources to cover Africa. It's easy for us to point fingers and say, look at how they're doing it. But we'll get their wires and their content maybe change a few words and then pass it on to inform other people about Africa in our localities. So what do I know of Gabon? What do I know of Togo? What do I know of Cameroon, which supposedly I share a shared destiny with? This is where it comes from. So how is our narrative going to be any different if we're not creating it for ourselves? It's good that we're talking back, you know, and saying, hashtag, someone tell Fox News, someone tell CNN. And it's good that we're creating a new narrative, but you know, all we're doing is editing a story that's already been written. You can get in and edit, maybe change a line or two. But what we need to do is write a new story. We need to sit down and think, who are we? What do we stand for? What are our values? Where are we going? What are our principles? What is our identity? What holds us together? This is a woman that I met when I went to Ghana to do a story on migration. So the talk around migration, obviously, you, you know what it is. So I decided, well, I'll do a story about people who are going to Africa, because it's very easy to get the idea that everyone is trying to leave. So this woman, Imacus Okofi, moved from America, New York, where she'd lived for 50 years, and she went to Ghana on a business trip, and she never went back. She said, you know, she visited the slave dungeons at Cape Coast Castle and said, all I knew about Africa before was Tarzan. That, 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 that was actually her reference. She expected to come and find people with bones through their noses. These are actually her words, you know, running around in, in um, leopard skin or something. And yes, this was many, this was 25 years ago, but still, she's, she's been in Ghana for 25 years now. And one of the things she's done is she has a museum. She now runs a hotel. Um, around Cape Coast, and she has a, a museum that she says, an Africa museum. And she has these amazing pictures of all the leaders of our history, and she has um, 
a small section that deals with African inventions. Yes, African inventions. And she told me a story that made me really sad. She said one time there was a group of kids from the area who came to her place and she showed them the, the little section for African inventions. And the kids got so excited, they ran back home, told their parents. And she says one child came to her and said, actually, when I told my parents about this little museum for African inventions, they said, you lied. They said, in fact, the way she say, say it, said it was, okay, I've forgotten how, how, how they say it, but I think it was, you let, you let tell lie, something like that. Did I get it right? Yeah? You let tell lie? Yes. And basically, this child was told by their parents, this woman lied to you. Nothing was ever invented by an African. And we're growing up in a world where everything is telling us who we are. I never for a moment felt the feeling of being a minority until I stepped outside the borders of my country, stepped off my continent, and I was suddenly told that you're an African and this is your place. This is who you are. And because I hadn't had any concept of what actually being an African was, that's what I had to deal with. That's what I had to work with. And so how much of what we know about our identity is really true? When the migration story breaks and everyone's talking about how everybody's going everywhere, where are we to say that actually a lot, most migration within Africa is within Africa? It's only 0.2% that come outside Africa to Europe. This is a continent of a billion people. 100 million a year is actually not that big. But we get lost in the context because we're not telling our stories and from our perspective. And so I don't think it makes any sense to keep pointing fingers and say, why don't you cover us fairly if we're not covering ourselves fairly? <laughs> we, need, we need to start a dialogue where we, as Africa, talk to the world and say, actually, this is how we do it. I love a website called Africa Fact Check. Recently, the Daily Mail published a story saying it's unsafe to drink water anywhere in Africa. They published a story saying, actually, that's not true, and they had statistics and research to prove it. That's great. But also, what we need is to begin a dialogue with ourselves. It doesn't make sense that we have 14 trade pacts in Africa, but hardly trade with each other. We'd rather trade with everyone else. Why do I have to go to Dubai first before I can go to another African country. Why, why can we not harness the power and immense energy that is on our continent just by speaking to each other? I would love to turn on my telly and hear about what it's like to be a fisherman in Gabon or a teenager in Togo. I don't know what that is. I'm from Uganda, but I had hardly any idea what goes on in Africa unless the BBC or CNN or Fox News tells me about it. I think it's time to change that. I think it's time that we stopped focusing so much on a story that's already written and started writing a new one about what it means to be Africa, African and what identity Africa has, one that's not based on a struggle but on progress, one that's not there because we have to have it, but because we want to have it. Thank you.